So we uh, heard a lot of things about why foaming might be occurring, ranging anywhere from microbial, right? We had a new superbug that was somehow making foam uh, to small changes. I think one that uh, got discussed a lot is just uh, distiller's grain because it was something relatively new in the ration uh, that seemed to correspond with the time of foam. Uh, but going into it, we tried to come up with a few other theories that might be behind that. And if you look at sort of the outline or how people have studied foam in other industries, uh, a wide range of industries ranging from beer to uh, uh, types of food where we want foam to occur, oftentimes we're using sort of a, a three-phase system where we need a surfactant, a stabilizer, and some sort of gas. And I think the hypotheses that we sort of started to generate really uh, tried to tie into those things, either looking at the gas production phase, so a, a hypothesis related to more methane production, or small particles to stabilize the foam, uh, but trying to quantify each of those characteristics and, and really put a, get a handle on them. Uh, so one of the first things we did was uh, a methane production rate test. Uh, and in the two pictures here, uh, you can see some different manure that we, we sampled. And, and this test was really supposed to be short term and representative of uh, just what's happening in the manure pit. So in this case, we weren't inoculating it or adding anything to the manure. It was really just a sample of that manure brought back put in these bottles and then incubated for a, a short period of time at room temperature, generally right around three days. And I think what was really interesting about this test is in, in many cases, if we got manure from a foaming pit, uh, you could see foam develop here, even within that bottle. So oftentimes that bottle might be uh, one to two thirds full of foam, or even in a couple cases, uh, we might have it uh, explode and pop out. Uh, but we were really trying to get a handle on that gas production phase. So we quantified how quickly it was making gas and it's specifically methane. And one of the things that we saw really strikingly throughout the, the entire time we sampled this manure, which was a, a, over a, basically a one year long period at 60 barns in, located throughout Iowa and Minnesota. Uh, in the case of foaming manures, methane production rates, so how quickly those microbes were producing that methane, was much, much more rapid, about three times faster uh, than in the non-foaming barns. And I, I think in some cases that sounds intuitive, right? We knew that foam had methane in it and we knew we were getting explosions. Why wouldn't you expect higher methane? But uh, it's still interesting that that came through. And, and that, of course, led to our next question of why this might be true. And if you look at what people have done to study uh, methane production before, there's lots of things out there that they look at, whether it be the quantity of food. So oftentimes that's talked about either in terms of uh, total or volatile solids, or sometimes even volatile fatty acids, which are the direct precursor to methane, or the quality of food, uh, often measured by either uh, a biochemical methane potential test. So basically putting those solids in a bottle uh, with some microbes that we have uh, keep as an inoculum source and seeing how much they can make, uh, but really looking at those, just the characteristics of the feedstuff itself, all the way to just uh, maybe there's a difference in microbial community. And certainly I have two graphs on this slide for you to look at. Uh, the first one there being total solids, and what you'll see is the, the blue bars, those would be our samples from a foaming barn. Uh, the red samples would be Red bars would represent samples from a non-foaming barn. And then you're looking at four layers, A through D. Uh, the A layer would be just the foam itself, right? So we don't have a corresponding layer from that from our non-foaming barns. Uh, and then B, C, and D would be increasing depth. So B would be a sample right from the surface of that manure. Uh, C would be about the middle of the manure storage, depending on how full it is. And then D would be right from the bottom of the storage. Uh, so trying to get the sludge that's sort of settled at the bottom. Uh, if any of those layers were less than two feet, they weren't sampled. I think the big thing when you look at solids, we do see a little difference in the solids content between uh, the foaming and non-foaming barns near the surface, but those differences are actually quite small. Uh, on the other hand, when you look at the volatile fatty acid data, uh, we tended to see a higher amount of volatile fatty acids in the non-foaming manures than the foaming manures. And in some ways that might seem counterintuitive. Uh, the VFA, it's a precursor to methane. We know that that's one of the substrates that methanogens, the microbes that make this methane, uh, they take and break down and convert into methane. So you might think that more of it would need more methane, uh, but our data said we were getting less methane from these barns, but there was more of this VFA there. Uh, the other thing, we, we knew that microbes probably played a role. So we did spe some specific gene sequencing for both the amount of microbes in the manure, and then a few different types, looking at methanogens, uh, sulfate reducers, and bacteroides in particular. And there you can see I have it grouped into three categories, either being from the foam itself, the foaming manure, or the non-foaming manure. And while the foam itself did tend to have different amounts of methanogens 
and bacteroids than either the foaming manure or the non-foaming manure. We really didn't see much difference between those two manure types, uh, which was an interesting phenomena uh, because we thought if it's making methane faster, that probably means there's more methanogens, but our data didn't, just didn't bear that out. But again, that bottom graph, if you look at it, one of the things we tried was to see if they would respond differently to different types of substrates. Uh, so we took some fiber, oil, protein, sugar, and soybean hull fiber, uh, added it directly to the manure. We added about uh, one gram of COD of each of those substrates. So you'd expect to make somewhere right around 400 milliliters of methane from that uh, thing you added. And what we saw is that the foaming manure, the microbes in there, uh, they really did a great job of eating almost all the COD that we added. But for whatever reason, the non-foaming manures just didn't respond in that way. We generated very little uh, methane from that. Uh, so despite the fact that we have similar amounts of, of microorganisms in those manures, there's something about them that caused them to respond vastly differently. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more on that in detail when we look at some of the microbial data. Uh, one of the things that we focused a lot on uh, to get started was some dietary studies. And we did four of these overall. I'm gonna highlight one of them that was, uh, I think, most valuable throughout the study. But uh, this diet, we were really focusing on how two different factors, the grind size of the feed, either grinding it fine to uh, 350 microns or coarse, which was about a 700 micron grind, uh, versus, uh, and as well as looking at diets. So we had three different diets in this, either a corn soybean meal, uh, corn with 35% DDGs, or a corn soy hull diet, uh, impacted what was coming out of the barn. And uh, Brian Kerr, our... Uh, so my nutritionist from USDA really did a great job of putting these diets together, uh, balancing them for the sort of rations we tended to see at finishing barns in Iowa at the time. And one of the things he did for us was estimate the different amounts of manure uh, that were being excreted from these animals uh, based on diet. So in this table, I have the corn soybean meal diet is highlighted there in the blue. The corn 35% DDGs diet would be in that orange color. And what you can see is he is showing us the difference in the amount of solids from each of those components that would be excreted, as well as the amount of carbon. And the big difference here is uh, we estimated something like 6,000 more pounds of carbon are being excreted when we feed that DDG's diet in the 1,200 head barn. Uh, the graph on the bottom there is sort of to help you put into the perspective what this might mean for methane production. So that would be the amount of methane we were getting per gram of sample. And the three on the left, uh, that you're looking at. Those three bars would represent our coarsely ground diets. Uh, the three on the right would be finely ground, ground diets. Uh, so you can see that the coarsely ground diets resulted in a lot more potential methane production uh, remaining in the manure. So I think that isn't a large surprise. We know that grinding uh, our feed particles finer generally increases digestibility in the pig. And that's exactly what we see here with this data, right? If it's left in the manure, still has more potential remaining. That was carbon that essentially the pig couldn't get at. Uh, the other thing you'll note is we did see a pretty substantial difference between corn soybean meal diets and corn distillers diets in the amount of methane that uh, was still available with just like the carbon estimate indicating that since there's going to be more carbon excreted in the distillers grain diet, we're going to have more potential methane available. The other uh, thing we did with that study is we sequenced the micro microbial population uh, from our manure storages. So in that uh, study, these were done with feeding crates. Every day we would collect the manure samples, add them to a manure storage uh, that was specific for each animal. So each one of these triangles would represent one animal uh, when we were feeding that. And I know there's a lot of points on this and uh, I don't have any labels on the, the axes. And, and the reason there's no labels on the axes for this graph is it's a non-dimensional sort of scaling. Uh, the important thing to take home is that two points very close together on this graph would, rec would suggest two microbial communities that are very similar in both the numbers and types of microbes that exist in that. On the other hand, two points that are very far away from each other would have vastly different microbial communities, or at least relatively so. And I think there's a few things that you can see on this graph. One would be if you look at just the orange uh, symbols on the graph, that would be our corn soy, soy hull diets, and the green and the blue would be representative of corn and uh, corn with DDG diets. And what that, those, the separation between those types of uh, microbial communities are really telling us is it's a difference in fiber type. Uh, 
corn fiber is much more soluble than soybean fiber, and that resulted in a different shift of microbial community. The other thing you can tend to see is that there's a carbon gradient on this graph running from the lower left-hand corner to the upper right with increasing carbon content at the lower half. And you can tell that because these filled in symbols would represent the more coarsely ground. And from our earlier study, we saw that that meant there was more carbon potential for methane production. And that was true both of the corn diet all the way down through the DDG diet sort of as a continuous flow. And I think the big take home here is that we do tend to see that different diet types can push microbial communities in different directions. But even within a single diet type, there's a lot of spread uh, for whatever reason. In particular, these studies tended to suggest that only about 50% of the microbial community we developed uh, could be predicted by the diet we were feeding. The rest was just other unexplainable variation uh, for whatever reason in, in our studies. So certainly diets can play a key role in uh, changing our microbial community, but there's lots of other things going on. Uh, the next thing we really wanted to look at is, in addition to just the methane, was is there something about foam that's making it special or where is this stability coming from? Uh, so certainly we knew that foam was stable, but we tried to quantify that, what that was. So here I'm showing you the half-life in minutes of how long that foam would last. And I think there's a few key things to note. Uh, the first being that, in general, unless we got that sample from near the surface of that manure, we tended to see very little stability in the foam, right? So there's something special about these surface layers. And in particular, there's something special about the surface of foaming barns, right? Uh, we're looking at half-lives there of 1,500 minutes. And if you just get a sample of manure, it only lasts 100 minutes or something like that, with non-foaming manure being much lower. So there's really something special going on there. And after I'd made uh, our student on this project do this for a while, uh, he started to notice a few things and tell me that he could predict which samples would have stable form or stone form stable foam uh, when he took them to the lab and tested them. And I said, well, if, if you know that, tell me what they are and, and then we can try and investigate those things. And he said, well, it's really important that they have lots of solids in them, but it can't just be any solid. It has to be a particular type. So he said it had to look fine. And his definition of fine was it had to look like flour. Uh, so we did some particle size analysis to try to quantify that. He also talked a lot about how quickly the, the water or the manure would drain out of that bubble matrix. Uh, so a few things to look at. And then he said color was important. If I get a clearish white foam, it doesn't last long. If I get a gray brown foam, it sticks around for a long time. And we started to do some research on what that meant. And it says in the literature that if you see gray brown foams, those tend to be protein. If you're seeing white foams, that tends to be fat. Uh, so with that, we had some idea of, you know, what we we're going to try and look for on the chemical side of uh, why we might be making these foams. So some of the first things we did on that was look at uh, particle size. Uh, so if you look at this upper, the graph in the upper right hand corner of the screen, uh, we sampled a bunch of particles on a laser diffraction unit uh, to, to get what the particle size distribution of those manures look like. And we did that for foam, foaming manure, and then the non-foaming manure. And if you look at that blue curve, we can see it looks a lot different than either of the two manures. And in particular, particles that were about two to 50 microns were much more concentrated in that foam uh, than they were in the manures. The other thing that sort of stands out to me on this graph is there's even a little difference between those foaming manures and non-foaming manures. And the interesting part is that the foaming manure itself tends to be depleted in particles those si that size relative to the non-foaming manure. To some degree, this points towards the particles in the manure separating up into the foam, sort of like a dissolved flota air flotation unit would work at a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, that gas that's moving through the manure uh, is causing a flux, whereas some of those smaller particles are riding them up to the surface. Uh, the other thing that was really interesting that we tried to quantify was that viscosity. Uh, and you can see here, we did that in a few different ways. Unfortunately, I covered up my label there on that graph. Uh, but the blue bar would represent either the manure or foam as is, so not altered at all. Basically, we got a sample of it, brought it back, and measured viscosity. And what you can see is that the foam itself was much, much more viscous than either of the manures. At first, that didn't come as much of a surprise to us uh, because we knew that that uh, foam itself was much more solids rich than uh, the manures, and higher solids contents tend to cause more viscosity. Uh, so after we said, well, we knew that would be true, it doesn't teach us what we thought we wanted to learn, we came up with the second plan, and that was to uh, centrifuge all those samples. Uh, so we took them to a centrifuge, spun them quite quickly, uh, and we should have only had 
small particles left remaining, measured viscosity again on them, and lo and behold, the foam still came out more viscous. And the one thing that we noticed from that is, even after we centrifuge them, the foam seemed to still have more of those particles in it. So we said, that's not quite fair. Uh, we really want to get rid of all these particles. So we took it one more time, uh, ran it through uh, filter paper, uh, under pressure through a 0 0.05 micron filter. So we had out almost all the solids uh, and that's what the green bars would represent. And even after we did that, we still saw that foam was more viscous. So it's not just the particles in the foam, but something in it in that foam itself that's really causing that viscosity. So after we took this data, uh, we sort of got interested in really what that particle that might be causing the foam to stabilize would be. And here's where we stumbled on a bit of luck. Uh, some of the research that had been done had shown that tannins can inhibit methane production. Uh, so we were doing some uh, studies to see how well those tannins could inhibit methane production. And as part of that study, every two weeks, we were taking out a sample and uh, running it through our foam column to see if it would cause a stable foam or not. Uh, so we threw the, these tannins in. We started here with uh, some manures that were foaming and some that weren't. Uh, in this non-foamy manure, we had uh, generally no foam stability. Uh, it wasn't too exciting to us. But after we threw that tannin in, something changed. Uh, we didn't get spontaneous foam, but when we'd run a gas sample through it, we could see a big foam matrix develop. And uh, certainly that wasn't our intent, but all of a sudden it was really interesting. And uh, after we did it, I talked uh, in great detail with our uh, our chemist, Steve Tribu from the USDA, uh, to see what was, he go what was going on. And he said, there's, there's really something special about tannins. Not only were they, were, were they particles that, that were about that right size, that two to 25 micron uh, range that we saw earlier, uh, but they interact really, really well with proteins. Now we aren't saying that tannins are the actual stabilizing part, how, particle, uh, but we did learn something about the type of chemistry that that particle would have. And, he, and to him, it said proteins were important. So up to that point, we had been focusing sort of on surface tension and how that might impact foaming. And that, that experiment really changed sort of our process. And rather talk, than talking about uh, surfactants and surface tension for foam, we started to look at it more like an emulsion. And uh, one of our favorite emulsions to use as a comparison is uh, the meringue on your lemon meringue pie. And it turns out that in many ways that's similar to what we had on the manure foam. Uh, when you're making meringue, it's, it's sort of a mixture of that egg white mixed with sugar, right? So a protein and then uh, carbohydrate. Uh, so that led us to think, well, what could those proteins and carbohydrates be in manure? Or at least can we show that something similar is happening? Uh, so the first thing that he did for us was uh, quantify the protein content of both the foaming manure, the non-foaming manure, and then that foam itself. And what we found quickly was that in the foam itself, the protein content is vastly enriched. Uh, so that was uh, a nice sign pointing towards this emulsion might be true. Uh, the other thing we did, since you've seen that we kind of like centrifuging and getting rid of, the, getting rid of those solid particles, uh, we did the same thing here. And once we centrifuged it, that difference went away. So the foam was no longer uh, enriched in proteins once we got rid of those particles, uh, sort of indicating that th some of those small particles are at least proteinous in nature. So that handled half of what we wanted to look at there. Uh, the other half was we needed to find that sugar. And uh, the way he did that was he developed some methods to quantify total carbohydrates and total hemicellulose of uh, the, man the foam in the manures. And again, we saw significantly higher uh, carbohydrate and hemicellulose contents of the foam relative to the manures. The other interesting part of that study is in order to quantify those carbohydrates, you have to do a digestion. And down here in that picture, we're showing the centrifuge tubes that uh, had the digested effluent in it. And uh, at most of these tubes, once you centrifuge them, you'll see a, a bunch of solids sort of settle out of the bottom, sort of stuff that just didn't get digested or was inactive. Uh, and normally you don't see anything at the top of those bottles. And for all our manure samples, that was the case. However, with the foam, we saw something different. We saw the, this black sort of oily substance accumulate on the surface. And that would have been oil that was somehow attached with the sugar and it wasn't available until we freed it by digesting that sugar. And to him, that data all suggested that it was a microbially produced polyliposaccharide or at least some sort of microbial polyliposaccharide. Uh, so that really gave us a handle on sort of what the chemistry behind the foam is. Uh, we had learned that methane production was super important 
uh, that the foam itself is more like an emulsion caused by proteins. And uh, this microbial produced polyliposaccharide.